Hey, welcome to the First Issue Club. We're your weekly comic book reading club that focuses on first issue comic books and sometimes comic news. This week, a little light on news, you could say. A little light. Between when we record this and when the episode comes out, Mm -hmm. we'll have lived through Earth's very first Disney Plus day. You know what? I was going to sneakily bring this this up, but you beat me to the punch. How will we ever gain podcast fame if we don't cover Disney Plus Day? I still haven't seen Shang-Chi. I haven't either. I'm going to see it for free when it drops on Friday. Same. So. Star-Lord's been in some shit, Mr. Star-Lord, press-wise. Oh, Christopher Pratt? Christopher Pratt. The voice of everything, apparently. Oh my god, Mario. He'll be voicing Mario. He'll be voicing my favorite, Orange Tabby Cat, who has a salty disposition for Mondays. Garfield. We're talking about Garfield, folks. Yeah, Garfield the cat. Are any of the other Garfield family characters, aside from like Odie or John, Uh going to be in the movie? I don't know. Like Everyone's so bent out of shape about Garfield. It's like, like, who's voicing Odie? That's who I want to (laughs) know. Well, Odie doesn't talk. Right? That's all. Oh, you know what? And that's a damn shame. Mm-hmm. It's, hashtag give Odie a voice. <laughs> I think it should be Tracy Morgan. Okay. <laughs> Which, did you see that he replaced the old racist guy on Squidbillies as the father of Squid? No. Yeah, the father of Squid. Oh, that's funny. And it is, it's pretty funny. It's like completely different, but it is. I did not know that was even a show still. It's in its last season. I had a hard time watching that just because it was so, like, gross out and it was, shit, yeah. like shitty looking. Yeah. But I will say that is it Dune or no, Blade Runner mm-hmm. is getting an, oh, an adult swim show. Yes. While it is animated, it's like heavy CGI animated. Have you so seen the trailer? It, it I'm looks guessing? like really realistic. I've seen the shortest, shortest clip. So like they have like a short teaser for it and it looks so stunning. Yep. I have an update for the image union. Oh, yeah. What's happening? Uh, So the image company has agreed to meet with the union. Okay. To essentially hear out demands and see if they can't find a common ground. Okay. So a small step, but a step in hopefully the right direction. Yeah, I know. And people, like you guys explained it really well, and people were kind of confused online. This isn't artists or writers Mm -hmm. or this, I mean, this is people who work in their warehouse or manage their social media stuff. This is like the actual salaried people that work at Image Comics. Which, if I'm correct, I believe I read it was 12 people. Which is astonishing. Yeah. That is, like, bewildering. Image is this, like... Huge. Huge behemoth. They're, like, yeah. they're like number three in the comic mm-hmm. book realm. And it's ran by 12 people? Yeah. That's wild. That's nuts. It just proves what you can do when you put your mind <laughs> to something. Uh-huh. So, I mean, I hope Image does the right thing here in is a trailblazer in the industry of approving the union. It's 12 people. Like, how much are they going to buckle your bottom line? Yeah. We have a podcast union between us here in the group. <laughs> we take a 15-minute break every 30 minutes. That's right. And on that break, we drink a cool, crisp Boulevard Brewing Company Space Camper Ale. Space Camper. It'll send you out of this world with their cool, crispy notes of hoppy goodness on the tips of your tongue. Sometimes if I'm working and I can't drink on the job, Mm -hmm. I pour a space camper and just lick the foam. Oh, totally. Or just like let it like aerate, like wine. Exactly right. Let it fill the room. Get some of that hops filling the room and on the tip of my tongue. You know what? That you've touched on something brilliant. And if they haven't done it yet, they should. Boulevard beer scented candles. I think they got them. Oh, well, you know what? With the holidays coming up, that is a great gift for all your friends oh. out there that want to enjoy Boulevard beer, but don't want to drink it just at that moment. Bonus plug for you, Boulevard. Get them candles while they last. We're working on that year two sponsorship. Yeah, we want that candle contract. That's where the real money is. It's in candles. Is that a Woodwick? Ooh, baby. Oh, speaking of where money's at, I saw I was at a gas station today. Wow. And there was a big sign. I know. Lati da, high roller here. Is it self serve or do they serve you? Or? <laughs> self serve. I had to fill my own tank. Oh, good. Um, there was a huge sign in the window that says, Buy Bitcoin here. At the gas station? At the gas station. Wow. And I almost went in just because I was so curious to be like, What do you mean you sell Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> there are like, some are ATMs you, that do it. Really? Yeah. I was like, are you making a profit? 
off of people coming in to buy Bitcoin? So I th- or is it just that they've got the ATM there and they get normal ATM fees? Yes. Like every time you use the ATM, it charges you two fifty. Uh huh. I think you're dead on with that. Okay. I think there's a separate Bitcoin ATM. Now, why it's at a gas station, I don't know. There's or some kind of marketing thing that probably proved that. Or why you wouldn't handle that business on a cell phone. Right. Like, well, if you're on the go and you need to, like, transfer money, mm-hmm. and like, to a Bitcoin account for some weird reason. <laughs> right. And your phone's dead. <laughs> right. Like, that seems like it's the only people who that's for. Are ATMs, like... Gonna go the way of the payphone, you think? I haven't used an ATM in a really long time. Right. I like, swing by before I go on vacations uh-huh. and load up on cash for like tipping in case I run into something. You go to the strip club. Yeah, or... right. I, <laughs> I need some fives for the club. Wow, fives. Holy shit. I'm a high roller. I can't go to the your clubs. <laughs> um in any but I just have that one five and then I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> One tip, and then it's like goodbye, ladies. Respectfully, madam, I'll be heading towards the back. <laughs> I'm cashed out for to the enjoy evening. my soda <laughs> and the view. We we've, we've got a lot of goofing. Have then. we goofed and meandered plenty to mm-hmm. get this podcast really going? I'm ready to talk about some first issues right now. I want to first discuss with you today Rom V and Al Ewing's Venom. Yes, let's get into it. We've been waiting for a long time. Donny Cates had, I think, three years mm-hmm. uh, in the Venom run. Took it to new heights. Yes. Much like Al Ewing did with his Immortal Hulk run. Yeah. Very, I think, poetic ending to both of their runs mm-hmm. that they're now switching places. Yep. And it seems like they're both kind of like existing in some essence in space. Mm-hmm. Like there's outer space elements to both comics, which is kind of cool and has this neat alignment to it. Yep. So I'm I'm just digging the general vibe and aesthetic of it from that standpoint, first and foremost. I don't even have to read it, mm-hmm. and I'm already just kind of jiving with the what's going on. Yeah. But Rom V, of course, like we mentioned, joining Al Ewing in this new run. Do you feel like you felt this book particularly – had a Rom V or Al Ewing voice to it. I couldn't tell who was writing with what. Right. I assumed when we are with Eddie Brock in space, that's Al Ewing. Um, when we're with Dylan down on Earth, that's Rom V. Okay. Because if you've been reading comics for a while, Al Ewing is the space guy. He's the cosmic, you mm-hmm. know, guy for Marvel. And then with Rom V, he always tells. These small, compact, personal stories. Yep. Uh, we've seen it a uh, hundred times before with, with his indie stuff and with some of his DC stuff. like His Catwoman run. His Catwoman stuff. Like, he's honed in. Layla stars like that. Yep. I think he did some Miles Morales. Mm-hmm. So, like, he knows those personal stories. And what better than Dylan learning how to interact and become Venom with the, with the symbiote now? Totally. I would love to get their ear and ask about that writing mm-hmm. work. I imagine they do it the same way that like Blink-182 writes an album. <laughs> they all go to a separate room, mm-hmm. write lyrics, and then come together, and then they just smash those lyrics together for a song. <laughs> yeah, so one person's writing, hello there. The next person just wrote down randomly, how are you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're like, oh my God, this fits. And they put it on a hat, shake it up, and dump it. Yes, and whatever, it's a Mad Lib. Whatever order it lands in. <laughs> That's pop punk, people. That's how we get it. Uh, you. So, um, I like I, that's how I saw it. They didn't really specify who's writing what. Yeah. Or if like they're doing issues, uh-huh. like one person writes one, another person writes another. We're seeing this more and more now with Spider-Man Beyond. Totally. And with uh, the, I mean, Hulk. Donny Cates is doing the whole thing. Yeah. Literally. But I, I kind of love it. I kind of love this like commune style of writing for comic books. And we've certainly seen it. I'll say that we've seen it done on Al Ewing's Gamma Flight, I believe, because there was a trans character. Yeah. And they wanted a trans voice telling the story. Yes. But it also exists within this world of that Al Ewing built, essentially, right? Right. So he's there writing it. Um, the, his co-writers, they're writing it, and you're getting genuine voices 
um, and the right representation. So it's a it's a great way to handle that, mm-hmm. and it's a great way I think to like onboard young writers into like huge stories that like I, I feel like there was a time when um, they were saying James Tinian's written some great indie books that we love, but we're bringing him on to DC and we think he'd be a great voice for Batman. But at the same time, you're like, do we give this guy who hasn't written? <laughs> like, yeah, do we just plop a, him right into the story? Huge comics, the literal biggest comic you could like the holy grail of like comics anyone wants to write. Yeah. So it it kind of made sense to put him on a book with like other writers and um, have him hang out for yeah. Tom King's run and write either with him mm-hmm. or pepper the story or well, yeah, write, I write mean, backup uh, stories, whatever it is. Nick Spencer's done it, and so has Dan Slott. Like, uh-huh. They just have people come on and help out. Like with, uh, I'm sure with like writing fatigue, I mean, Dan Slott was on, he's still on Fantastic Four, and that's been going for a while. Right. Nick Spencer was on Spider-Man for like three plus years. Yes. Like, Do you think or, or do you imagine this is a trend that will transition more into like later and into more comics later down the line? Yeah, I think we're going to be seeing this as kind of the standard for bringing on um, maybe, I don't want to say unproven writers, but like writers with a lot of buzz that just haven't written yeah. like mega titles at at certain publishers. Right. Well, that, it's almost like writing like a TV show. You have sure. like a, you have like a writer's writer. room mm-hmm. with you. I think that's kind of brilliant. Yeah. And something we haven't really seen in comic books yet. You're you're used to seeing these like one writer, one artist on a book. Yeah. And they're hailed as like, you know, like Peter David, like, oh, he wrote this great Hulk thing mm-hmm. for so many decades. Like, he's great. I'm sure Peter David would have loved some fucking help every once in a while. Yeah. Like this helps Marvel and DC maintain integrity of their comic book. Mm-hmm. Like I, I I honestly hope we do see that transition. Yeah. And it may be one of those things too where you have someone like an Al Ewing that's writing like five books at any given time. Oh God, yeah. And they do the sort of like Thomas Kincaid approach, or you know, like <laughs> he's got like forty people he employs that are painting Thomas Kincaid paintings, and then he comes in at the end and does like his a, signature, a couple dabbles of snow and a signature, and it's like I helped. First of all, you're sullying the name <laughs> of Thomas Kincaid, R.I.P. People spend the Cocaine King. <laughs> spend like 10 grand on Thomas like original Thomas Kincaid's and it's like he, yeah. some fucking intern painted that. Yeah. The same thing happened with Bob Ross. Yeah. But he didn't know it. That's fucked up. Yeah. Poor guy. In any case, that that could be a thing where he's just saying the maybe sweeping story arc mm-hmm. is something that I'm just kind of like throwing out there. Yeah. And then Rom V is writing the characters and a lot of the dialogue and scripting. Yeah. And then he's coming back through and sweeping it again. I don't know. We're purely speculating at this point, but hey. Yeah. Speculation's half the fun. If if Ewing or Rom V want to come on and, you know, tell us what's really going on, we will gladly have them on. I'll talk to them at C2E2. If you I are going to C2E2. That's right. Yeah, baby. So we talked earlier. Rose Besh is going to be there. Yes. One of my favorite artists coming up now. Uh-huh. And I have that silk cover that has her oh, first sneaker thing. Are you going to send that with me? Would you mind? Not at all. Oh, boy. <laughs> I would love to meet her. She is probably, she is, I think, on the cusp of like a Peach Momoko. Yeah. Um, like popularity. Yeah. And uh, it's, I think a lot of it has to do with like, she has this kind of knowledge of street style mm-hmm. that is part of what makes her art fun. Like she's, obviously she's doing characters that are like, Supergirl and Supergirl wears one outfit, and, she, and you, yeah. you're doing that character. But right. a lot of the characters that do have a little more like personality and style, she plays that up in in those covers, mm-hmm. and they rip because of it. Have you been noticing a trend in um, cutesy covers? Certainly, yeah. Uh, we have it with like um, Ryan Rainbow and. Rose Besh and Peach Momoko mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Scotty Young. Yeah. Like, we're getting these, like, softer-edged, like, kind of neon, poppy comic book covers. And I think we are watching the younger generation influence our comic books now. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's kind of cool. A lighter, happier side. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> definitely manga-inspired. Yeah. Like, oh, for sure. And it's kind of fun watching it, it transform a little bit. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, we I, we came in here to record, and you had your your new Wonder Woman out, and it had like this tough looking Wonder Woman, but it also had like a, a softness to it, and I was like, oh my god, that cover is like super striking. It it looked a little like when Mary Poppins steps into cartoon chalk scene. Yes, <laughs> and has like the little birds and yeah, and talking animals flying around her and stuff. I was enamored. You're definitely right. It's one of those things that's like definitely happening, but I needed someone to articulate it to me to be like, yeah, that is a big time trend now. It's and, cool. And you're 100% right that like so many people around that age group grew up with so much anime and that's such a huge inspiration into so many new artists' style. So, well put, Greg. Oh, thank you. Bravo. Cool. Great take. <laughs> what will the world hold for us next? Are you excited for the Venom run? Yeah, I think so. Um I'm not sure what I expected. I'm not sure if I like loved it. I I, like I wasn't gaga over it. I wasn't let down by it. Um, I was happy that it seems like fresh. I was a little surprised by like how much they've aged Dylan. So if if you haven't been following it, Eddie Brock has a son named Dylan who is now Venom, Mm -hmm. and then that leaves Eddie Brock who had been Venom, open to sit on the throne of the King in Black. He, like, rules all symbiotes. Right. And can kind of, like, ho- ho- like hop around his mindscape and control all these alien symbiotes all over the universe. Um, so he's on a galactic level. Dylan's on a street level. They, like, kind of had this cliffhanger ending where it's like, did Eddie just die? Is Eddie lost in space and time? Mm-hmm. Um, really big things that I think are kind of like, whoa, where is this going to go and is it going to be too much? Mm -hmm. (laughs) We talked about this like really personal story that we're going to get and then we threw um, Eddie like thousands of years into the future or thousands of years into the past. We're not sure. There's ways to go big without being like so large that you lose control of what you're doing. Right. We just did this sort of cosmic god thing. Yeah. And it was null. Right. Now there's a different cosmic god that's like a symbiote originator or something. Yeah. Ultimately, it sounds like our verdict may be we enjoy the personal stories with Dylan Brock Mm -hmm. and fear that we've gone too big, too quick, or more same old, same old with Eddie Brock. Yeah. There wasn't enough here in this book. This deserved the double issue treatment. Yeah, so we could see a little more of where it's going. I see a lot of time jumps in my yeah. future with this Venom run. It's going to get confusing, especially as like, and when you do stuff like this on a monthly basis too, it gets confusing. And I'm not going to lie. I loved Immortal Hulk. I read all of it. There are issues where I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and I pulled out back issues and I reread a couple preceding it. And I was still like, who is this guy now? And (laughs) what's the point of all of this? Are people that much smarter than me that they're just like, I absorbed it completely. I understand every little piece and parcel of it. Or are some people just like, I'm going to pretend to be smart. And just because the book felt smart, I'm going to be like, it was amazing. (laughs) I think there's a lot of pretenders out there. Yeah. Oh, well, let's talk about another comic. Yes, let's. The name of this comic is, Greg? The Furthest Place From Here. A long sentence one. It's by Tyler Boss and Rosenberg. You may remember this dynamic duo from an Aftershock book they had called Four Kids Walking to a Bank. Was that Aftershock? Was it Aftershock? Or was it Black Mask? One of those two. Ooh, I think it was Black Mask. I think it was. Yeah. This book was mega sized. It was a beefy baby. Sometimes when Image does first issues, they'll do a double mm-hmm. so you can get more story, more context when needed. Yep. Especially for an indie book, sometimes it's easier to buy in when you've got a little more pepper in there. Yep. Um, this was <laughs> triple sized. I, I read this digitally. Yeah. And, and I'm like, like God when is damn, it going to end? I'm still scrolling. <laughs> yeah, it was a big book. Um, but I'll say that for me personally, it read really quickly. There's several yes. like title pages in it too, where they're like next chapter. They kind of broke it up into bite-sized pieces, mm-hmm. where it seems like I think by the end of the comic, we had been through like nine or ten chapters. Yep. So if they're saying this one's triple sized, then the next time we get like an issue, it'll probably be like three chapters. Yep. 
of the story. But in any case, it was a great way to introduce us to these characters and this world. I think had it not been the size it was, yeah, I would have been like, what is my takeaway? 100%. It really needed to be long for me to like start caring about them and yeah. um, be interested in where it's going. And so I'm glad they got to tell the story the way they wanted to. This could this single issue I think could have stood alone as a trade and I wouldn't be mad at it. Yeah. I thought like it had a good beginning, middle and end and even though we didn't get context for like the entire world, there was enough there that I'm like happy with like the context I did get and the blanks that I could kind of fill in myself were there. It was a kind of like a dystopian future thing, Mm -hmm. but that it's not said outright. And it's one of those things where like there's a panel at one point where they're showing the outside world and you're like, oh, the world's falling to shit. That's why it's like this. Do they make mention of a war? A couple times. And so something has happened. Mm -hmm. And apparently everyone's been hitting the head with a bat because they don't know that this girl is pregnant. They don't know what's happening to her body. Did you get that sense of, like, they kept referencing her of just, like, we'll figure out what's happening to you. She said she was sick. Right. You know what? I didn't realize that her quote-unquote sickness Uh was a pregnancy thing. Like, I know she's pregnant. Yeah. And I just assumed that everyone knew she was pregnant. Right. Unless it's, like, some kind of immaculate conception kind of thing. Uh Uh-huh. There's a bad guy in the book that has a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the the guy who's with the pig masks. Yeah, the guy in the pig gang. <laughs> the, okay, so... I know we're jumping around a little right. bit, but there is a pig gang, and someone has, like, a baby and a baby Bjorn in, in the pig gang. This this is essentially so, like a Mad Max kind of thing. Like, there's different tribes and stuff that are warring with each other. Yes. And we're following this They've got different punk places tribe. of a neighborhood. Yeah. the Yeah, the main characters and the people who, like, own this neighborhood mm-hmm. uh, hole up in a record store. Yep. But like the old vinyl records and everything, yeah. which for me was kind of like, it's cool that once society is lost, mm-hmm. you kind of have to end up in a record store to like love and appreciate music. Sure. Because you're not going to have electricity. You're not going to be able to stream things. Uh-huh. Uh, powering a CD player might be rough, mm-hmm. but, you know, old gramophone. Yeah, you can you, just crank it. You can totally like play vinyl still. Yeah. So- I thought that was kind of unique and neat. Um, and it makes music kind of like the lifeblood or like a, a, a central through line of of the book. Yeah. The way they talked about it at the end in the like writer's notes, they were just talking about the influence of music and how much it shapes you in your youth. Mm-hmm. And this book, one thing we didn't mention that's kind of like the sci-fi element is that there are these two characters that they refer to as the sisters and they look like creepy lanky witches Mm -hmm. and basically they drop the kids off to different gangs that are in these like neighborhoods as babies and then the other kids raise up take care of these babies until they're old enough to become part of the gang and once you're an adult you have to leave you're right so there is room there to your point earlier that, you know, they're not getting sex education. They maybe uh-huh. don't know yeah. how babies are made. They think babies just get, like... Dropped off. Dropped off. Sure. Right? So they just don't understand pregnancy. Which, it's kind of like... A, that's like a, a Lost Boys Peter Pan uh-huh. uh, idea of it. Um, did you pick up that, like, in in this punk tribe, they have to select a record that, like, speaks to their identity as, like, a... Yeah. Like a, like a trinket or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she chooses... Uh, Hall and Oates. Hall and Oates. Yeah. And the guy's like, no, not cool enough. <laughs> like, you're doing it wrong. And so she, now she has to go pick out like a different punk record or whatever. And I was like, I was like, what? what is this? This guy's trying to shape her identity. I didn't like it. N- yes, same. Yeah. Like, let her have Hall and Oates. Let like, her have Hall and Oates. What's it to you, shithead? Yeah, totally. But, but but yeah, I I I that's what that's part of that I what I thought was cool about it. Like so much like they're all young people, they're uh-huh. all coming of age, they're all picking an album, 
so much of like when you're younger, like music defines so much of who you are. For me, it was one of the first things that like I can be like, this is what makes me unique is mm-hmm. I like this band and most people like that band. Um, <laughs> and they're fucking idiots. <laughs> so I I just identified with that piece of it. And it, it I guess it just helped uh, bring a vibe or certain nostalgia to this book that otherwise was like, you know, sometimes with indie books, especially with this many characters, it's hard to get you to connect. And that was kind of just like a universal way that we're all the same and identify with music that helped my connection with all the characters in the book. Yeah. Um, Our, we had a character die. His album was Husker Du. Oh, and beautiful he record. And carried it around with him, and they burnt it at the end when he passed away because it, it leaves with him. Yeah. And some people are like, no! <laughs> <laughs> Not Don't burn. Do. Don't burn. Not Husker Neon do Arcade. Album. What are you doing? <laughs> you fucking idiot. That's the first pressing. We only have one. <laughs> we can't listen to it ever again. Um. So I'll, I'll say this. Okay. Here comes some takes. And it's kind of how I felt about the Venom book. All right. I trust these creators. Yeah. Because they've made great stuff individually and together. Yep. This book was, like you said, triple sized. I still don't know what the fuck is going on. Like okay. the all the context clues are scattered at best. We don't know where the adults are. We don't know what the fuck caused any of this. We have these two weird alien sister things. We have a fraternity pig mask group. Yeah. And like it's 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 like I need a a, a through line somewhere. Yeah. Of what's happening or why it's happening. I don't know. I loved it. I didn't have that much of a you're you're right that that you don't get a lot of flat out explanation of what exactly is happening but I love the idea that there's this mystical city that everyone thinks is a lie. Yeah. And potentially when people are leaving as adults they're finding that thing. One of the kids sets off to find that. Mm-hmm. It's very I don't know fairy tale-ish but in um you know set in the real world obviously like a fake version of our world but um, some sort of real world boundaries there that bring it down to earth a little more than a fairy tale. <laughs> it's not Alice in Wonderland level like out there. Yeah. The most sci fi thing about it was the sisters. Uh huh. Otherwise, everything is like could happen based in reality. Sure. The society could collapse. Right. And it will. <laughs> And like we could have these, you know, uh-huh. you could have te- gangs of teens. Gang- and they, and they well, could... more gangs of teens. <laughs> I'm already scared of gangs of teens. So I really dug it. Yeah. I I bought the um, vinyl mm-hmm. version uh, online. I pre-ordered it, and I haven't gotten it yet. But uh, I'm really excited to receive that. I think it's fun that they're giving you like a physical collectible mm-hmm. along with the comic. Um, I'm really excited to see where it goes. I'm more pumped to read the second issue of this than I am Venom. That yeah, for sure. Like I'm, I'm definitely picking up the second issue because yeah. I'm just like I have got to see mm-hmm. where this goes. I'm guessing there's a lot of just hype for this book. There were a bunch of covers. Yeah, there were like six or seven covers, and <laughs> not, not as much as that. What Muffy the Pimp Slayer book or oh whatever? Oh my god, what? What is that book even going to be about? I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, I do know what it's about. It's this... a uh, pimp slayer named Muffy. Yeah, her the char- the main character's uh, father is a pimp, and he killed her mother, I think. And now that she's grown up, she's trying to get revenge and kill him. Okay, and unknown comics who is an online retailer who is famous for their retailer exclusive covers mm-hmm. kickstarted this book themselves so they're oh really i did not know that yeah they're they're self publishing it and they got a lot of the like normal people who do the custom covers to do the um kickstarter incentives for it and I, it's it's again one of those things where you kind of assume that like if I'm kickstarting this, this is the only way I can get these things, and then they end up listing all the covers on their 
website website for purchase anyway. Yeah. Which if I had bought it on Kickstarter, I'd kind of be like, eh, I'm a little pissed about that. <laughs> that chaps my ass. But I didn't. I didn't get it. I normally avoid the like Kickstarter things that are like this is horny only, mm-hmm. and it looked like that. Yeah, very boob centric. Yes. So I skipped it, and then it shows up on the unknown site today, and including the regular covers, they've got trade and virgin versions, and then the metal cover versions. Oh, my God. And then they're doing graded ones that you can purchase and yellow label graded ones that you can purchase and on and on and on. And it ends up there's 156 different versions of this you can purchase on their website currently. Fuck off. Good luck. (laughs) They're going to have so much backlog of this stupid-ass book. Give me a break. I'm sure they're hoping it takes off, but I don't know. Yeah, they're hoping for the dynamite success. If we print Uh, enough covers, someone will buy enough where we'll break even. Well, who knows if they'll make a second issue. I don't know, but I bet they made a fucking ton on the Kickstarter, so they're probably made in the shade. Is the curiosity of that, of just the the insanity of 156 variations to buy this book, like, what is this read like? Like, what is this first issue even about? Yeah. Part of me thinks that there's a reason the title was kind of like a spectacle. And then a lot of the covers are homage covers, which is normally like, you know, we kind of have like a built-in audience that's like, I want all the Something is Killing the Children homage covers. Right. Or like, I'm a huge Kill Bill fan. I collect all that shit. There's a Kill Bill homage cover. I think they're just banking on a lot of those things that make a Kickstarter successful. It's almost like... They wrote down a checklist of how do you cash in on a Kickstarter? (laughs) A you know, female lead with big boobs. Check. Incentivized homage covers. Check. Check. Really out there, attention grabbing name. Check. (laughs) Check. They probably killed it on what people paid, but I don't know. I hope they got the stray dog guys to do a cover. (laughs) Oh my god, they didn't, but I've seen about enough of those dudes. For Tony Flex, I think is his name. <laughs> Dude, Tony, go cash your checks and just stop for a minute. Yeah, take a time out. <laughs> you've, done, you've done enough. <laughs> Let's cut it and take it over to the Patreon. See you guys later. Bye. First Issue Club is brought to you by Boulevard Brewing Company via Space Camper Cosmic IPA. Our music is courtesy of the fine folks at Primary Color Music. You can find, friend, and follow us on social media at First Issue Club or FirstIssueClub.com. You can support First Issue Club by joining us on our Patreon for additional content at Patreon.com slash FirstIssueClub.